it seems that the mainstream media is using a term to describe those who defend themselves against attacks that could have led or has led to physical injury or death as vigilantes. Hello, the Range Ronin here, and I want to talk about this. There must be a clear, definable distinction between being vigilant and being a vigilante. During this presentation, I am going to address what is called the force continuum from both the law enforcement aspect of which I have experience and the civilian aspect of which I have experience. There may be aspects of this presentation that you disagree with, and that is fine. My job is to simply put forth information that I believe is relevant to the use of the terms such as vigilant and vigilante as they apply to defending oneself from physical harm and possibly death. I hope that you will stick with me for this journey. Let's start with what being vigilant actually is. While the common definition is one who is alertly watchful, especially to avoid danger, the extension of that is what is commonly referred to as situational awareness. Situational awareness is the use of the sensory system to scan the environment with the purpose of identifying threats in the present or projecting those threats into the future. This simply means using your senses to scan your environment. We are now focusing on how your sensory system gathers information. Start to be aware of your surroundings. What can you see? What time of day is it? Can you hear any noises? Can you feel anything? Feeling can include temperature as well as pressure. You use all of your senses. What does your sense of balance tell you about your surroundings? Through your situational awareness, you become aware of something. Since you are looking for threats, something drew your attention to that car behind you, or who is approaching you, or who is approaching someone else, or who is approaching your house. Next, your mind made an assessment, and your body responded with a message of either the situation looks normal, or that people acting like that look dangerous. In other words, you projected the picture in your mind into the future. Can situational awareness, the constant scanning of your environment, make you paranoid? I suppose it can to a degree. A healthy paranoia may be a good thing. Paranoia, however, tends to distort the ability to discern danger from an imagined threat. This is true. You can't constantly be scanning your environment actively, looking for threats without it wearing down your body and sanity. There is medical evidence to support this claim. Instead, you look out for anomalies. Spotting an anomaly simply means to look for a pattern interrupt, something out of place. An environment is a major factor. My survival paranoia began while in the military. That's when I realized that there are those that want to kill me simply because I exist, and that I need to recognize them first to prevent that from happening. That line of thought carried over into my civilian and law enforcement life. That line of thinking has made me more aware, but I don't let it rule my life, at least not consciously. One morning, I was sitting in my favorite Waffle House having my favorite breakfast. Prior to walking in, I had already scanned the parking lot, and after I had entered, did a quick scan of the place. Is that being paranoid or simply vigilant? While eating my favorite breakfast of a light waffle, three eggs over medium, and sausage, a young gentleman entered. He was also wearing butt-cracked jeans and a hoodie over his head. I also observed him scanning his eyes darting left to right. Of course, a flag was raised in my brain. I quickly glanced outside and saw no vehicle parked close to the door that might indicate an accomplice. The gentleman approached the counter. The waitress approached him, and the next thing I knew was that he was there to pick up a takeout order. I relaxed and chuckled a bit. He was, after all, doing the same thing that I did, checking things out. Let's just say that I had the necessary wherewithal and tools to respond to an emergency, and I'll leave it at that. Now, 
Let's try this scenario out. At my domicile, I have three alert systems, dogs, cameras, and lights. The dogs are the first to alert me to something that may be ordinary or not so ordinary. My lead hound is very good at letting me know when furry creatures are on the porch or in close vicinity of the house. He is also very alert to two-legged animals that approach the house. I can tell by his bark what is what. He is the first line of defense. His barking alerts me to check the cameras. 99% of the time, it is an outdoor family of cats that we feed, or a scheduled delivery. 1% of the time, it is someone who I don't recognize, and that's when a trip to the door to further observe happens. Let's just say that I am equipped with a tool that can be used in an emergency, if need be. That I consider as being vigilant. Let's look at another scenario. It's late at night, and you and your family are sleeping. Up to this point, all has been quiet, until you are awakened by what sounds as breaking glass, or maybe a sliding patio door opening, or maybe a sound outside that could indicate something is being broken into. Your senses go into high gear, and the adrenaline starts to pump. You check the monitor for your cameras, if you have them, and you see two bodies around your truck, one inside, and one outside. You go for your favorite home defense firearm, rifle, shotgun, handgun, no matter. You or your spouse dial 911 and inform them that your truck is being broken into and give them the needed information. Then you head down the stairs. You flip on any outside light that has not already been turned on to alert the burglars that you know they are there. Unfortunately, they do not flee. You now have a choice, confront them or wait for the police. You know that it will take some time for the police to show up. The situation is not life-threatening at this point, but damn, they are either going to steal from your truck or steal the truck. That's your property. You decide not to wait for the police and confront the individuals. With firearm in hand, you head outside onto the porch and begin yelling at the individuals. You now perk up. See with a firearm and decide to exit stage left. You pursue them down the driveway. They are heading toward a vehicle to make their escape. There is a chance that another person is in the vehicle who is the driver, but you don't know that. As the individuals are entering the vehicle, you decide to pop off a few rounds in their direction. Whether your rounds hit someone at this point is irrelevant. Congratulations, my friend. You now have gone from a vigilant person a victim to a vigilante, which by definition, as you know by now, is a person who is not a member of law enforcement, but who pursues and punishes persons suspected of law breaking. You have now turned yourself into judge, jury, and vehicle for justice. You will, my friend, pay a price for your actions. What that price will be, I can't say, but there will be a price. I am just going to put it this way. There is a thin blue line between vigilance, being a victim, and a vigilantism. And that line defines a boundary that you, as a civilian, cannot step over, by law. Now, let's put forth a third and final scenario. It's late at night. You and your family are sleeping. Up to this point, all has been quiet until you are awakened by what sounds as breaking glass or maybe a sliding patio door opening. Your senses go into high gear and the adrenaline starts to pump. As in the previous scenario, you grab your home defense firearm to take it with you as you investigate. As you reach the top of the stairs from your bedroom, you see two flashlights lighting up the darkness on the main floor of the house. You yell out several expletives while telling whoever is down there to get out. You have called the police and that you have a firearm. You see the two individuals sprinting to the front door, the door from which they entered. 
As the second person reaches the door, he turns and points in your direction. You see the flash, but never hear a report. Your body is in fight mode. Things seem to go into slow motion. You feel the disturbance in the air as the projectiles fly by you, striking the wall behind you, past which lies your two kids sleeping in bed. You don't feel the recoil or hear the report of the shots from your own firearm, which is pointed in the direction of the person who shot at you. While you are not hit by his bullets, he was by yours, and you don't hear him grunt as the bullets that you fired strike his body. He stumbles as he goes out the door. The air is heavy with smoke and the smell of burnt gunpowder, but you don't even notice it as you move down the stairs to the door. Your attention is focused on that door, anticipating that one or both individuals will return, but that doesn't happen. You don't even notice the lights that are going on in the houses in the neighborhood. You don't hear your wife and kids screaming. You're still in high alert. You look outward, firearm still in hand and ready to fire. If you had a pump shotgun, you don't even remember racking a new round into the chamber. If you had a semi-automatic pistol, racking a new round, if you have the one left, is done automatically for you. If you had a revolver, the next round is waiting to be fired unless you fired them all. Lying on the grass in the front yard is a body. The body is the burglar that you shot. You did not even hear the squeal of tires of the car that made it possible for the other burglar to escape. You are focused solely on that body lying in your yard. A later autopsy would reveal that he was a teenager and that he died from five gunshot wounds to the front of the body. He might have survived three of them, the two were deemed as fatal. What your response at this point will be, I can't say, as that varies with individuals. The police will eventually arrive, and what will happen after that, I cannot say, because they will be faced with several scenarios that must be responded to. What I can say is that your world, at this point, will be turned upside down, but you and your family are alive and once again safe. Your vigilance has been turned in your favor, in the long run, but that does not mean that the nightmare is over. I can also say with reasonable assurance that you will become very busy during the investigation that will follow, and possibly any legal actions, criminal or civil, against you. I can also say that with reasonable assurance that you will be called a vigilante by some, including the mainstream media. It's at this point where I need to switch gears. I need to talk about using lethal force and the continuum involved in such. Now, I am not an expert like Masada Ayub, nor do I claim to be. I can only speak from my training, my experience, and my knowledge of the force continuum subject. First of all, a continuum is an escalation or de-escalation. A force continuum is an escalation or de-escalation used to define levels of force and the means to mitigate such. In simple terms, the force continuum is used to define what levels of force you can use to stop a level of force being used against you. In 1972, Kevin Parson, a PhD, developed the force continuum for civilians. It was later modified by use of law enforcement worldwide by various agencies and in various forms. There is a distinct difference in the force continuum used by law enforcement and the force continuum for civilians. However, there are also similarities. The force continuum for civilians is little known to civilians, and unfortunately, this lack of understanding has turned many civilian victims 
than the criminals when trying to defend themselves. So let's begin by defining the use of force. Use of force is defined as a situation where it is necessary for someone to use legal force, whether it be verbal or physical, in cases of criminal or civil activity, self-defense, or defending others. I cannot emphasize the word legal enough. If an act of force offends the conscience of a reasonable and prudent person, it may be found that the level of force used is unlawful. To put this into perspective, I am showing the force continuum that is commonly used by law enforcement. After this, I'll again bring up the civilian version of the force continuum for discussion. As an overview, in order of least to most severe, five levels of use of force are 1. Officer presence 2. Verbal commands 3. Soft or hard controls 4. Intermediate weapons and 5. Lethal force It is important to note two things when considering the law enforcement use of force continuum. 1. When the threat is contained, the use of force stops or de-escalates. And two, the use of force can start anywhere in the continuum model at any time once a threat is recognized. The standard use of force model consists of five levels and is represented by three segments. Segment one, subject action. Subject action is known as the amount of resistance that the suspect is giving. Segment two, officer perception. Officer perception is defined by the officer's perception of risk or how the individual law enforcement officer assesses a situation based on the subject level of resistance. It is common practice for officers to use verbal commands while also observing the subject's visible presence and demeanor. Segment three, officer response. Officer response is the amount of force given based on the subject's actions. As in physics, the use of force model shows that every action has an opposite and equal reaction. The officer responds in kind, depending on how the suspect decides to act. As the subject shows increasing levels of resistance, the officer in kind responds with an increase in his or her level of force in order to make the individual comply. As mentioned, an officer starts by utilizing physical presence and then verbal communication. If the subject is compliant, then everything is fine, according to the standard use of force model. Contact controls, like arm holds and wrist locks, are used when the subject begins to show signs of passive resistance, such as refusing an order to get on the ground. Active resistance can occur, for example, if the subject is resisting an officer who is trying to restrain them with handcuffs. An increased level of awareness and compliance techniques is utilized in this case. The threat of imminent bodily harm is perceived when a subject becomes assaultive, wherein physical injury is possible, in their level of resistance. The threat is then met with defensive tactics, such as punches and kicks, or with less lethal options, such as pepper spray, stun guns, tasers, expandable batons. The highest tier of assaultive behavior is met with deadly force in the form of a firearm. That's the simplified version. You should be able to see that the level of force used for compliance is applied anywhere in the force continuum, is dynamic in nature, and depends on how the officer perceives a person's actions and demeanor. I need to point out that the actions contained in the force continuum for law enforcement is intended for control and restraint of a subject but can escalate to the use of deadly force in a heartbeat. Now, let me talk about how the force continuum applies to civilians. The force continuum for civilians follows a tiered approach as with the use of force continuum for police, but with different aspects. And like the force continuum for law enforcement, there is escalation and de-escalation of force. As mentioned earlier, use of force is defined as a situation where it is necessary for someone to use legal force, 
whether it be verbal or physical, in cases of criminal or civil activity, self-defense, or defending others. Let's take a look at the levels of force for civilians. Level 1. Presence. Situational awareness, verbal communication, and personal alarms or yelling. When a criminal seeks out a viable target, they want to make sure it is not someone who is aware of their surroundings. Situational awareness is the first level of presence in the civilian use of force continuum. By being cognizant of your surroundings, you are able to react quickly to impending danger. This is the vigilant part, if you will. After identifying suspicious behavior, verbal communication is the next step in making your presence known to a potential threat. This allows you to show an attacker that you are aware of or suspicious of his or her intentions and that you will not be easy prey. Personal alarms and a heavy amount of noise made by yelling or screaming is the last part of the first level of the continuum. Not only do criminals not want to be caught off guard by an aware target, but they avoid noise like the plague. Once their cover is blown, they have little chance of succeeding in their attentions. Level 2. Martial Arts, Kicks, Throws, and Empty Hand Techniques Martial arts are the next step in the continuum. However, this is only recommended if you know close combat tactics and if you are already in close range, too close to grab a weapon though there are exceptions with certain products. If you are not experienced in this, or if you have distance on an attacker, move to less lethal force. This is the next step. Pepper spray is the first option, with tasers second and stun guns last. Level three, less lethal force, pepper spray, stun guns, tasers, expandable batons, etc. Expandable batons sit at the highest level of force for less lethal weapons. They should only be used by someone who is trained in how to use them, as these devices can become deadly weapons if they hit the wrong section of the body, such as the head. I need to make you aware that impact tools, such as baton, expandable or not, tonfa, kubaton, nunchaku, etc., are considered as martial arts weapons in most states and are illegal. Check with your state and local laws about such items. Level 4. Lethal Force, Firearm and or Knife Finally, lethal force in the continuum, one which no one hopes to get to. This is reached when someone decides to pull a lethal weapon on you, such as a knife or a gun. You are generally justified with using lethal force under these circumstances. Be aware that the use of force continuum for civilians is far different than what the police go by. Law enforcement officers use force specifically to subdue a suspect and make them compliant under order of arrest. As a civilian, your only job is to stun and run. Stun your attacker to stop the threat and run away to safety. Escaping from a direct threat is your only objective. Ultimately, every action you take will be scrutinized by a court of law. And, unlike the police, who have a union to protect them, you are on your own. Be careful in how you address your situation, but not too careful as to hesitate and potentially lose your life, especially under lethal circumstances. Remember that the use of force continuum is a general guideline to go by, and not something that is absolute. Well, it's time to begin wrapping this up. If all of this seems bewildering to you, that's totally understandable. I have seen many people come into the Sally Port with alleged charges relating to the use of unlawful force, ranging from simple assault to premeditated murder. A person, a victim, who defends their life or the lives of others with lawful force should not be labeled a vigilante. But being labeled as a survivor is acceptable in my line of thinking. Due vigilance may not stop violence, but due vigilance to the force continuum may lessen the possibility of using unlawful force to defend yourself or others. 
I want to close this out with what happened at a Rokito Taqueria in Houston, Texas on a Thursday night, shortly before 1130. This has been all over the news and internet. A mask robber brandished what appeared to be a firearm and takes wallets, cell phones, and cash from customers, as surveillance video from inside the restaurant showed. As the masked man appeared to be leaving the store, one of those customers was armed, and as the robber turned from him, he drew and fired his weapon multiple times. Those shots were to the back of the robber, as the surveillance video shows, and not while the robber was facing the shooter. In a tweet by the Houston police, the department acknowledged that the robbery suspect had been fatally shot. Police reported that no one else in the restaurant was wounded, and it was later discovered that the robber was not actually armed. According to a police spokesman, identified only as Lieutenant Wilkins, the robbery suspect, he came into the store. He was wearing a mask and gloves. He had a plastic pistol, either an airsoft or possibly a little BB pistol. The shooter then retrieved the valuables from the robber and returned them to the victims, and then he and the victims left the restaurant. The robber had been shot nine times, four and then another four in the back, with a final shot to the head as he lay on the floor and after the shooter had taken the gun of the robber. Only then did the shooter realize that the gun was fake. The Good Samaritan turned himself in the police later and was released. Whether this incident goes further legally or civilly, I cannot tell you. That will eventually come out one way or the other. I will surmise that the case evidence will be presented to a grand jury for review. I will not second guess what a grand jury's decision will be. In cases where the threat of grave bodily harm or death could not be avoided, through the various levels, including situational awareness, assessment, assistance, and action, then the only option left is deadly force. At what point do I have no other options other than to use deadly force? Is the basis of the civilian use of the force continuum. One can only ask what was going through the shooter's head between the time the robber entered and turned to leave the store. What was his mindset? I cannot show you the surveillance video, but I can provide a link in the description. You can make up your own mind. The shooter was labeled by some media outlets as a vigilante. Others view him as a hero. What's your take? At this end, I thank you for sticking with me, and I hope that this presentation was informative. I am planning on many gun and gear reviews and maybe controversial topics like this one in the future, and I hope that you will return to indulge yourself with them. Until then, be safe out there.